Hello, welcome to this very special edition of The Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Tompkins Square Park here in the heart of New York City. This past summer, the closing ceremonies of this year's 2022 Charlie Parker Jazz Festival featured the legendary Archie Chef and Jason Moran featuring jazz vocalist Cecile McLaurin Salvant. In a career spanning some six decades, Mr. Shep has collaborated and recorded with the likes of Anthony Braxton, Wadada Leo Smith, Cecil Taylor, Arnett Coleman, and John Coltrane, just to name the many endless few. This gentleman was born in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but grew up in Philadelphia. In this interview, you're also gonna see a very special interview with me and his dear childhood friend, the great NEA jazz master and bassist, Reggie Workman. All three of us sit down and we sit and talk about his upbringing, how he was exposed to this music, and how the two really, really threw musical ideas off each other throughout their 60 years of friendship. And also, Archie sits down and talks about some of his very important musical influences, including the great Sonny Stitt, Benny Golson, and Lucky Thompson. Also in this interview, we sit down with Jason and Archie to talk about their album, let My People Go, which is a set of recorded duos, which was recorded right before the COVID pandemic broke out. So sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of this year's 2022 closing ceremonies of the Charlie Parker Jazz Festival, featuring the great Archie Shep with Jason Moran and Grammy Award-winning vocalist Cecile McLaurin Salvan, live here on The Pace Report here in New York City. Thank you. 
history right here. Um, Mr. Shep, Mr. Moran, thank you for sitting down with me. Um, this album, Let My People Go, it's interesting because one, you guys recorded bits and pieces of this of your tour, and this is a reflection of duo performances, but it's also a very important documentation of two generations of black American music. How did this come about? Well, Jason and I met in Germany, and uh, uh, he uh, was part of my, uh, a very uh, instrumental in my being chosen a jazz master at the, uh, and, uh, at, at that point when we met, he, he was uh, well I, I guess he, he was not uh, able to, to, to talk to me about my having been chosen and uh, so we talked very generally and casually and uh, <clears throat> I was very impressed by this young man because, uh, as you say, he re represents another generation of this music, and uh, he's, he's very humble and uh, uh, very gracious. Uh, so I, I, I've been very happy and, and proud to, to work with him. Uh, uh, this is this is another aspect of another uh, part of my career. Um, I have now arthritis in, in, in my right hand, and I I can't really always express the things that I want to the way I want to on the horn. So I've been doing uh, a bit more vocals and like that, but Jason has been a, a wonderful support in, in every every possible way. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to, to have met him and uh, very proud to work with him. Jason, as a person who has been really, really steeped in, in the tradition of this black American music and the history. What are some of the things that Mr. Shep has imparted on you as a musician? And what is, and how has your piano playing changed during this process? Because the world gets to see a very different side of one you performing with a duo ensemble. And then two, you're adding Cecile in this mix also. So that takes this to a whole different level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, I mean, Shep is, when I was in college, I used to listen to fire music all the time. So fire music is like one of the important records in history for me. It was because the composition was strong and also Archie liked to growl. <laughs> you know, it's a growl, and I was like, "How you make the piano growl?" You know, like how you know how can you get to a thing that feels like, like you could shred sound? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's what I was. The only way you get to something like that is if you work with somebody who shows you how to, to saw that way through the music, and also to to go through the music in a way that, that also lets lets everyone who's hearing it knows how difficult it is to make it. You know, there's no illusion in the music that Archie makes. It's, it's real, you know, it's a reality. Uh, it's historic, you know. Uh, it tells a portrait of him, of his vision on what's happening <coughs> around him. So you kind of always are, in, with the understanding that it represents a moment in time, rather than something that's just about an aesthetic. And, uh, and I've always cherished working with masters like Shep. Um, because they 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 challenge me, 
um, to try to get to, to the level. So um, working together as a duo for the past few years has been amazing. One of the things that I've noticed about Archie's career is that he's lived the experience and we hear it, you know, Attica Blues, the record you talked about. There have been some, and then also him going to Africa and studying and touching the indigenous people of our culture. Why do you think that Archie's legacy is very important now in the moment, Jason? Well, look, it, 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 it's not a fad to stand up, you know? Like, it's a, it's a reaction. Or it's like a birthright that, you know, people give you backbone that tells you you have to stand up wherever you are for the people. Um, and I think right now we're still at a crossroads of how do we do that, you know? And within the business of music, you know, in the business of culture. And uh, young artists like me and uh, the crew of cats that are younger than me need to see how, how does this, how does it age, right? How does it, uh, how does it join forces, you know? How does it look beyond America, you know? Um, how does it look beyond discipline? I mean, Archie's kind of influences wider than just, you know, just the music. Um, so that part interests me a lot. And I also know for the new crew coming, how do you make something that people will still care about 50, 60 years later? You know, it takes a lot of effort to do that. And, um, and it's not always easy. And you almost, and sometimes you won't get the applause or the awards, you know, for it, but you will have saved people's lives. And I feel like that's what artists still today need to be reminded of too.
Archie, do you feel that this music is in good hands? Do you think that jazz, the blues, hip hop, do you think, and even gospel, do you think that moving forward it's in good hands or do we still have a way to go to keep the artistic integrity of our experience in the music, but also the education component of it also? Well, yes, uh, I had the privilege to, uh, to record with the Chuck D, uh, mm. a, a public enemy, a, a few years ago, and uh, I was really impressed by his his memory and uh, his appreciation of what this music is all about. Mm. <clears throat> And likewise, uh, recently I worked with Jason at the, uh, where was that, uh, when you did the... Uh, In here. The Kennedy Center? No. no uh, it was, uh, you did the, uh, the, the, the artwork. Uh, oh, right, we did Slug Saloon at the Whitney Museum. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, and, right. Uh, That's right. That's right. He, uh, he had the excellent idea to resurrect uh, some of the, the iconic scenes that really shaped this music, like the Onyx Club. He, he did, uh, in fact, uh, artwork which uh, commemorated <coughs> and, and uh, recreated images of, of the time, the Apollo Theater, <coughs> Not, not the Apollo, the uh, Savoy. Savoy Ballroom. Right. Um, I can remember when I first came to New York, I was 15 years old and we went to the Savoy mm -hmm. and uh, I was so impressed by the people dancing. Mm -hmm. I remember an older couple and they were really, uh, uh, they did a waltz. But, but it was uh, so imaginative and uh, I, I never forgot that experience at the Apollo, at, at the Savoy Ballroom. <clears throat> and when we, when uh, Jason recreated that uh, image for me, uh, I, I remember singing, uh, stopping at the Savoy. Oh, that's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We did do that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it, it was. I was really very impressed by uh, uh, his his ability to recreate history uh, 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 in an artistic way. I mean, um, in, in the in the manner of creating images uh, that that were visual not just sound images, but visual images that, that, uh, that uh, invoked that, ex that experience, those experiences. So uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm really very impressed by this young man and uh, his ideas, his imagination, uh, they've, they've done a lot to, to inspire me and uh, to make me feel that the, this younger generation does have something very important to offer by way of continuing and uh, Recreating an experience that had, that took place a long time ago. People come as we will be.
soil and um, you live here and you also live abroad and um, I'm going to ask you about your experiences at 80 something plus years old about how you've stayed rooted within not only just the music but 
just as a person? How how does this music keep you rooted? Well, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of Duke Ellington and Thelonious Monk and John, John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins, uh, uh, Lucky Thompson. Uh, the, these men have done a lot to uh, construct uh, the uh, the reality of, of, of blackness and uh, through their music and uh, through the song titles uh, Mood Indigo and so songs like that I have been able to hang on to and uh, reconstruct in my own way the experience of being black. No matter where I am, if I'm in Europe or Asia, uh, my roots are still with me and uh, part, partly through the, the creation of song and uh, the uh, the people I've, I've grown up with, like Reggie Workman, uh, who have been uh, very vital to me in terms of appreciating this, the history of this music and uh, have, have helped me to, uh, to to be myself and to find myself uh, in, in this experience. Archie, I, my foray into you was by a gentleman by the name of Cecil Taylor and um, that record that you recorded with him there's four songs now if memory serves me correct the tr song Air you guys recorded that 27 times is that true? no Okay, cause he, <laughs> I, I want because I've been hearing these stories about this. He he wasn't he was adamant that he he wasn't happy with the take. How many times did you guys do that take? Oh, uh, you mean how many takes yeah. did we do? Yeah. I don't know how many takes we did. We might have done quite a few uh, when we recorded it, but I, I don't think it was twenty seven. It was times. twenty seven. So okay, that sounds a bit much. Yeah. yeah. Cause now how. How did you how did you and Cecil meet? How did how did your your friendship and your partnership and your musicianship? How did you guys meet? Well, through his uh, bass player at the time, Buell Nidlinger, uh, he used to come down to a, a, a coffee shop in the village, the Cafe Wa, where they had sessions every day, and I would be there sessioning with uh, the guy who led the, uh, who, was, uh, who was the leader of the sessions, Dave Pike. He was a, a vibraphonist. And uh, Buell came down one day and he happened to hear me. And uh, he recommended me to Cecil. So I was recommended by his bass player. And uh, I happened to meet Cecil one day on uh, in the West Village, and he was he had his coterie of people who were with him, and he, suddenly he broke off from them, and, and he, he I didn't know how he knew me. He said, "So you're Archie Shep." He said, "Do you want to make a record?" That was the record that we're talking about now, but we, we recorded Air. And I said, yeah, sure, I'd like to uh, 
And then at that, after that, I, I used to go down to his house just about every day and we practiced. I learned quite a bit from Cecil. He's a very intelligent man, a poet. He had studied fencing and he, uh, he was quite interesting to talk to. And uh, in fact, I, I first heard Malcolm X's name from Cecil Taylor. Uh, he was very politically engaged and uh, uh, I, I, I consider myself very fortunate to have known him. Was Cecil somebody that didn't really want to play within the confines of music or do you think that Cecil had his own voice and it took a while for people to understand what he was trying to do. Well, I think the latter, he had his own voice and it took a while for people to understand uh, not only what he was trying to do, but what he was bent on doing. And uh, he, uh, in that regard, he was a very unique, musician. Uh, he didn't uh, lean on the, the much of the tradition. He, help, he helped to establish his, his own voice and his own tradition. Uh, he was very fond of Monk and Duke. and. Uh, so in that regard, he uh, he, he was he 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 he, uh, he was part of the roots of this music. But on the other hand, he uh, he uh, rejected being a follower in the sense of imitating what other people did. Uh, he rather enjoyed creating his own direction. Did that interpret how Train and even yourself moved forward with the music? When did you start to just realize, okay, I'm just going to do Archie Shep? When, when did your voice really kind of move forward and throttle? Well, it had a lot to do with Cecil because... Uh, when I met him, I was very much uh, uh, a part of, of the tradition. Uh, Lee Morgan was a, a big influence on me, and uh, uh, the, the Philadelphia tradition was uh, very straight and, and direct. Uh, the, the idea of, of playing outside chords and uh, playing uh, outside of the tradition was not really thoroughly appreciated. Uh, at, at the time I was in Philadelphia and uh, I, I was able to, in, in fact I was rooted in the tradition uh, uh, I, as I say, guys like Lee Morgan uh, were very instrumental in, in, uh, in my learning chords and uh, when I, when I uh, finally did meet Cecil Taylor, I wasn't really that fond of, of what what he was doing, uh, I didn't appreciate it until he began to make me aware of, of certain things in myself that I had not explored, my own originality. And so, uh, uh, I, 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 I learned a lot from uh, my association with Mr. Taylor. 
Special guest, very dear friend of yours, just popped on the scene, Mr. Reggie Workman. Reggie, do me a favor. Reggie, tell me the very first time you met Archie. And Archie, tell me the first time you met Reggie. Well, I used to live next door to, to Reggie. <laughs> and a couple of doors down the street. I think you were at 60 and I was at 64. Uh, yeah, yeah. When you, I was at uh, 60 East Worcester. Yeah. Uh, and where 64 was the Lundy's place. The Lundy's place, yes. yeah. Yeah. And uh, Archie came up from Florida and uh, he was, a, he, what, 13 or 9, 8? Maybe about 10. He was 10 years old with mosquito bites all over him from being in Florida, and and uh, <laughs> a unique character who had a special uh, kind of demeanor, 
that we kind of gravitated to one another. And uh, we, we were all living in the same neighborhood, knowing all the same people. So we got to... I, I was an only child at the time, and Reggie came from a very big family. So I, I more or less adopted his family. I remember going to his home many a day, and Mrs. Workman would say, Reginald can't come out today. He's got his, <laughs> he's got his work to do. <laughs> and uh, but I, I knew all his brothers and sisters, and you know, they, they became my, my brothers and sisters. How did you guys come into the music? How did you guys base sax? How did this happen? Well, I'm, I should say uh, our neighborhood was full of music. Philadelphia was full of music. Our, uh, oh, there were bands around us. There were musicians around us. There were uh, all kinds of venues around us in, in those days when we were young. And we, I thank God for that because that's what really inspired us, to, I think, to be a part of that music. And all the like Archie mentioned before, all the musicians that we revered and studied and learned from, uh, it, uh, it was almost like a natural mentorship in the world that we live. And uh, I think the music was such that it drew us in to the language that we needed to communicate with people and to express ourselves. Reggie and I both were studying piano at the time. And he comes, his, his, uh, your cousin, uh, Charles Biddle. Charles Biddle, yeah. He's, he's very well known in Canada now right to this day. We were young kids and uh, uh, Mr. Biddle used, used to be hold rehearsals in Reggie's living room. Uh, who, who was in the band? Ellsworth Gooding, uh, the piano player. Uh, for, I can't remember his name, the gay guy. He was in his band. Uh, and he had a drummer, but very seldom did the drummer come to our house. But Charles Biddle was the one who encouraged me to stand up on the chair, air boy, play the space, put the bow in your hand. And and I realized the feeling of the bass and the sound of that vocal cord. And, uh, and listening to them rehearse and understanding what they were going through right in our living room uh, encouraged me to move in that direction. You know, it's interesting because Philadelphia, piggyback on what you said, Reggie, you guys had Benny Golson, you guys had John Coltrane, you had Jimmy Heath, the Heath brothers. There was this intense music scene. And for you guys to witness and see and touch it firsthand, that added another depth to how you guys either shedded the music and how you interpreted the music. Yeah. I mean, uh, I can remember when I first heard Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Heath. <clears throat> I had uh, a good friend of mine, was a guy named Eddie Ford, and we, uh, we went downtown to Reynolds Hall, to the big dance hall, to hear Stan Yetz and uh, Jimmy Rainey. And uh, during... Uh, the intermission, we, we started, we wandered around the building and there was a little, uh, we call them cotillion dance. It was being held uh, upstairs in one of the rooms. And I remember seeing this guy, a little sh short guy with a big suit that you could hardly see his hands, but he was, he was playing how high the moon and boy, he played that tune to, 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 to the bone. And uh, in fact, we never went down, went back down to hear the rest of Stan Getz. Hmm. We, we stayed there and heard, listened to Jimmy Heath. And after he finished playing, I asked him if he could, if he would help me with my instrument. And he, he graciously uh, accepted to do so. And uh, I went down to his house that next week, 
and uh, I had a brand new saxophone, tenor sax, and uh, I, I could hardly get anything out of it. And I remember Jimmy was sitting on the on the cellar stairs, and he took the horn and he played it, uh, and he gave it back to me, and it seemed as if changed color. <laughs> he, he, he played so much on that horn that was just solo saxophone. And uh, I came back the next week for a lesson, and his brother Tootie Albert said, uh, "Jimmy is not here; he's been busted, mm. and uh, he went to jail for six years. I didn't see him." for a, a long time, and uh, he had been arrested for smoking a, a joint in the back of a car. Uh, when I did finally see him in uh, California, he was there with his brothers, and uh, I remember I had a, a bass clarinet, and I asked him if he wanted to play it. He said, no, he said, when I was in the joint, I was practicing the clarinet. And somebody, and I came back to my room, and somebody had broken the clarinet in half. Mm -hmm. He said, so uh, I haven't touched the, the clarinet since then. But it was really uh, touching to me because uh, Jimmy was. Uh, one of the guys that, that I considered a big influence on, on, on my playing and uh, that he should have to suffer so much over something so trivial as, as a, a, a smoking marijuana in the back of a car. And now we're in a time when it's yeah. legal to do it now. Yeah, it's and, crazy. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. 
think that Philadelphia, as far as the musicians, because I mean, there's a line of, I mean, you got Kenny Barron, you got uh, Jonathan Blake, the young cats coming out of Philly, um, who are doing their thing. Do you think that Philadelphia gets the respect like a New Orleans or Chicago or Detroit as far as the tradition and what you guys did moving forward? I think so. I think so. It does. It, of course, uh, you know, if the people who are coming from New Orleans and the positions that they've established and, uh, you know, the fact that Marcellus family has created a bunch of great musicians and people and uh, a, little, a lot of political connections, uh, uh, that makes them more in vogue and the fact that New Orleans is considered the Kind of, kind of the birthplace where all the uh, music, Louis Armstrong, a lot of the music started, a lot of the, the families began to develop in that area. Uh, that's important and that's part of our history. Naturally, it, it gets some acclaim, more so than Philadelphia, but Philadelphia is right down the street from New York. And a lot of people who come from all over the country would come to Philadelphia because they could stop in Philadelphia, stay cheap, and then run up to New York the way we used to do when we were supposed to be in school doing our homework and <laughs> in bed sleeping. We were running up to New York in the car to hear the last set at the Cafe Bohemia or, or whatever club any group was working. And, uh, you know, let's say, for example, now we have the wonderful... A uh, person like um, Christian McBride, whose dad used to bring him in the club by the hand to hear me play. Christian McBride and his father's a great bass player, Smith. Yeah. Um, Neil? Lee what's Smith. His name? Lee Smith. Lee Smith, yeah. And uh, that's, it's a continuum. And then you had the Gamblin Health Group, uh, you had the Morris family, you had the Van family with the Gospel Group. You had all uh, the, the funk groups that were around Philadelphia, the, you know, you know, name all, you, you name it. Uh, so many, I, I can't... The Ward Singers. Mm -hmm. The Ward Singers. The mm -hmm. Ward, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And then this we got the opera singer, uh, Jimmy D. Priest on. Mary Anderson. Mary Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, okay. wait a minute, wait a um, Sister Rosa Thar, she lived in Philadelphia. Right, right. right. There's so many people who came out of Philadelphia. And you had Herb Gordy who was doing arrangements at the Earl Theater yeah. for Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. And he was living right down the street from where Archie lived, where Archie moved to uh, yeah. when he moved from the Gordys. So the history goes on, and the continuum goes on. I heard you just mentioned with Archie a minute ago about the continuum and, and about the young people who have the job of carrying on the legend. And that's their job and they, the parents are a different place. They're getting a message, different message from what we got, which is not the same. We didn't have Jamie Abersall, we didn't have Sibelius, we didn't have all the things that are online today. We had to do it in B. Morgan's living rooms, listening to the records. and. And missing and going to the sessions and sneaking out and sneaking in the clubs and having kid happy put us sit in the corner and put a fruit bunch in front of us in the dark so we yeah. could listen to the brands. That is a continuum and that's a institution. And and we didn't talk about the fact that Archie was instrumental with Max Roach and Bill Hassan and Dr. Wiggins and and. Uh, Canval Adderley and Yusuf Latif and all to, to fight to get this music into academia uh, it's so that the world could learn the validity of African American music and the language that we spoke. That's a continuum that the young people have to learn and have to embrace in order to carry it on. There was a place where only we could go to certain places at that time. Uh, we could only, yeah, when you see the it. Apollo Theater, you can see why they tore down all the stores because we weren't allowed to go to all the places that we wanted to go to. But now we have taught the world a different way of being, a different way of thinking, 
and we have evolved beyond that idiom. And this music is, is universal. And it's important. It's a language. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that is it's a medicine for the people of the world. Reggie, what does Archie Shep mean to you? And what does Archie Shep mean to the world of black American music? Archie Shep is one of the voices that I think is, is very important to the world and to me as far as the fact that he stuck by his guns. We, 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 we loaded those guns together. We examined the ammunition that we put into those guns, and, and I'm speaking of euphemism, musical guns, meaning the language that the way he sounds when he plays and makes a note on his horn, the way he sounds when he interprets, the way he sounds, the way the band sounds when he makes an arrangement. All that happened years ago and continued to happen. Archie Shep was a brilliant young man in our community who decided, okay, uh, if I can't do it with the music the way I want to do it, I'll go into theater. And, and we are the recipients of the fact that he came through that school and, and decided he was going to do it his way. Well, Reggie is one of my heroes. I remember when he joined uh, Freddie Cole, uh, Nat King Cole's brother, and he left Philadelphia. Uh, I really envied him. Uh, because it was an experience that I, I, I thought was very important. And uh, I've watched him over the years, John Coltrane, Cedar Walton, mm -hmm. and uh, I know he's been very important. Farrell Sanders. Yeah. A lot, I mean, this man right here is like an embodiment of, of, of a world, of a time, of an era where our music was the dominant, the dominant force of all the injustices that were going on in the world. Both of you guys were, were a part of changing people's lives at a time when people needed the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Reggie has been an influence on guys like Wayne Dockery and Arthur Harper. Yeah. Uh, so many, uh, uh, Reggie Johnson, uh, so many of, of uh, younger players uh, profited from his experience and his expertise. Uh, so uh, I'm very proud to have known him and to have grown up with him and uh, to have known his family and uh, it's, it's really been important for me. Flat than a child in this land Not a child, not a babe can grow free the work of God, it only lasts a little while, but what the whole world really needs is a baby smile, Jesus. a baby smile. Oh, 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 oh. 
you said earlier that Lucky Thompson played a very important part. Also, Benny Golson to your melodic approach. What was it about those two musicians, and even Sonny Stitt, because that's another another one of your favorites, also. What was it about those musicians that enhanced what you were trying to do on the saxophone? Well, <clears throat> Lucky had a, a, a voice that I considered very unique. Uh, he, he evolved out of Don Bias, who was also a, a very important musician to me. And uh, Benny Golson, uh, same way. Uh, I like their use of vibrato on the horn and uh, Benny's originality and Sonny Stitt uh, were very important to me. Uh, e even now I'm a big fan of Sonny Stitt. <coughs> They've done a lot to uh, help me to, to find within myself uh, uh, a direction. Do you think that as a musician, as a saxophonist, and as a composer, your role is to keep the experience going because Attica Blues is a very important piece of music that you and some other stuff that you've composed over the years but composing is something too that we really don't talk about we talk about a musician's musicianship but we talk about like um, Wayne Shorter we talk about Duke Ellington we talk about great uh, composers writers uh, Fats Waller they were steeped in not only the tradition, but their songs live forever. How does a person continue to make music with people 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years from now? We're still singing and still playing. How does that continue? Well, I, I don't really know. Uh, when, when you write a song, you don't necessarily write for that song to live forever, but it, it lives within you. And uh, so uh, I, I would hope that some of my music would be continue to be appreciated, but uh, that's not why I created it. I created it because I was inspired to, 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 to write original music. You hate and detest the terms of how we label our music, especially jazz and avant-garde. Explain the reason why you don't like how people use the word jazz. And also, tell my viewers about the connotation and how the word jazz originated because it's a it's it's actually a European word that has been labeled and has been tacked on for the last over a hundred years. Yes. Uh, jazz, for example, is in my estimation a French term. They have a verb jazz, which means to talk uh, uh, to exchange a conversation in a light manner. Uh, also, the uh, the term jazz uh, is is used in its original sense by the French people. They have a term called le jazz which is spelled L-I-E-U-J-A-S-S. -S. 
and that's uh, uh, is, is a uh, is an animal shelter where the shepherds stay sometimes with their animals. It's called a lujes, uh, and that that term exists is still used today. Uh, the the the, uh, the the word jazz was originally spelled J A S S, and uh, it was used by the French people uh, who uh, settled New Orleans, where the word jazz is still used in. Uh, uh, it, it referred to uh, 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 a place where women danced behind a screen to, to piano music. People like Jelly Roll Morton and Wilbur Compton. Uh, Burlesque. Kind of like a burlesque. Yes, one could say that. Uh, but uh, so the term jazz uh, really became uh, it's used popular. It could mean anything: cigarettes, beer, uh, and. and uh, it, it, it tends to ignore the original creators of the music and, and uh, the, the suffering out of which that music was born. Uh, the spirituals and the work songs, uh, which were so important to its creation. So that. Uh, very, very seldom, it, it allows us the freedom to ignore the fact that African Americans created this music, and, uh, and uh, 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 like the Basin Street Blues. The lyrics ignore the the true creators of the of this music, and it makes it sound as though anybody could create it. Uh, so uh, I, I have tended to uh, object to the use of the term, uh, largely because it, it doesn't. Uh, uh, identify the, the true uh, originators of this music and the experience out of which it was born. That'll do it again for this very special edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at Tompkins Square Park here in New York City for this year's 2022 Charlie Parker Jazz Festival. I'd like to personally thank the incomparable and legendary Mr. Reggie Workman as well as the legendary Archie Shep for their time. Also, I'd like to congratulate and thank the talented Mr. Seal Lorem Savant, as well as the great Jason Moran. Also, I'd like to personally thank the staff and management for this year's 2022 Charlie Parker Jazz Festival, as well as the staff and management at GSI Studios. As always, people, I can't stress this more than enough. Please like, share, and subscribe to my videos here on YouTube and Vimeo, as well as follow me on social media by way of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. It's deja vu. It's the blues I feel. All to me. It's the blues for real. Can't sleep a week. All my thoughts belong to you.
In some particular place, in a long 